Welcome to the Tripod, where we break down the NRL every game, every week from a punting perspective. I'm Jacob Wynn. He's the Padonis. We haven't had a very strong start to 2022, to be brutally honest. Uh, as we addressed in the round four recap, we went one and two last week on best bets, and we lost the mixed matchup, bringing us to five and five on best bets, two and two on mixed matchups, and yet to win a multi with some close calls. And there's a bit of frustration in there. For example, last week, five games we didn't have a best bet on. We will correct five out of five on our leans. But ultimately, we just got to tip a bit better. And we're not panicking yet because we haven't been spot on in the way we've judged some teams. But with more opportunities to watch these sides, I reckon that'll help us. Don't you, Pedonis? Yeah, for sure. As we get more into the season, we've seen um, four weeks now how teams are what teams are good and what teams are bad and what sort of situational spots we can try to take advantage of. So let's see if we can um, do that in round five. We've got three best bets to share now, Jacob. We certainly do. We always share them right off the top. So the first one is Gulp, the Warriors. And we're on them this week after they heard us last week. We take them in the first half, plus half a point, $1.82 on sports bet. They host the Cowboys at Redcliffe. Look, they're pick them in some spots and slight favorites in other spots. So there's a significant edge right now uh, just being able to get them as an underdog in a market, especially first half, you guys know that, um, you know, it can easily end up tied uh, at 40 minutes. And this could be a tight game for sure. For me, the, I split the sides in what should be a pretty evenly matched game for one home advantage, second game in a row at Redcliffe, while obviously the Cowboys have to travel. And the spine, I do give the edge to the uh, Warriors, which could be the difference in a tight game as well. Any other major factors for you, Mateos? I had the same points as, as yourself, but one other thing that I sort of found in the game is that I think the scoreline last week that um, that the Roosters played against the Cowboys, I think it flattered the Cowboys a bit. I think the Roosters were a lot more dominant than the 28-4 to scoreline. So I think had the Roosters sort of got on with it and won by 20 or 30 points, then we probably would see the Warriors already be a favourite. So I think that the fact that we can take advantage of them as a small um, underdog on this first half market, I think it's a great line. So let's take it. And then the following day, Raiders plus six and a half, first half line again. They play the Storm at Wagga, and that price is $1.88 on Ladbrokes and Neds. The next best would be $1.86 on Top Sport. As we did last year, we like to take the underdog in the first half because that protects against a possible tight game, could be tight for 60 and could blow open late. And the Storm is certainly a side capable of doing that. And we, as we discussed on the recap, Raiders were not that far away from Manly last week. It's their second straight game in the country. Look, you've got to be brave taking on the Storm and they're in good form. And I can't really fault the Storm, but they won't have it as easy as they did against the Dogs this weekend. And the Raiders are a tough side that we believe can make a game of it, don't we? Yeah, for sure. And given the fact that Canberra were down 22-0 against the Gold Coast early, they were down 10-0 against Manly, I think that Ricky Stewart places an extra emphasis on them starting well. And I like them to sort of play the Storm through through the middle and they can sort of match them up front with the pack that they do have. And I think Storm played near perfect football last week, so that's a little bit skewed the market. So let's take the first half line again. And our best bets are getting progressively uglier because on Sunday we are taking the West Tigers plus 18.5 at $1.84 on Unibet. The next best price is $1.90 for plus 18 on Ladbrokes and Neds. The Tigers are not as bad as you probably think. In fact, they quite easily could have won their last two games. So instead they're winless, but they could have been 2-2 two and two, um, in some tight finishes the last couple of weeks. The Sharks are pretty good for sure. We've been impressed but to be this magnitude of a fa favourite, you've really got to be a solid top four team. Is Cronulla a top four team? You know, it's possible. And maybe by the end of the year, they will be. But right now, I don't feel like they're there yet. And even last week, we talk about score lines flattering teams. 18-0 flattered the Sharkies because the Knights are pretty mediocre. And that game was still tight with 20 to go, I thought. So I like also the fact that the West get a nice long turnaround. Um, I know that that was a heartbreaking way they lost last week, but they're going to have to pick themselves up because there's too many games left this season to give up. When you're getting plus 18 and a half, you don't need it to win. You don't need them to play outstanding. It could be tough to watch, but all we ask is they fight hard for 80. That's not too much to ask, is it? No, nah, let's get them um, fighting hard. Um, they, they should still show plenty of spirit and determination given it is only round five, so it's still early in the year. I like the fact that their defense has played a bit better than what the market sort of thinks that they are. Um, and then the other factor that you haven't mentioned there is that with Hines being their goal kicker, they are pretty pretty limited because he is in the bottom five in the league. So I think that for us to lose this line, 
the Sharks are probably going to have to score four tries more than the Tigers. So I love the fact that we're getting 18 and a half. So let's jump on that in, tr- in pure tripod fashion. That's right. We're not afraid to take the ugly duckling. Sometimes it, it, they, it is painful, but other times you, you find yourself a beautiful swan in there. Look, before we jump into round five, let's get an overview of, and market insights from our show sponsor, Toppy. Hello, Tripod family. Tristan Merlihan here from Top Sport. Round five of NRL coming up where we've got a bit of a change in how the markets are being created, where there's a there were a few more lopsided results there last week. It seemed a few of the favoured options or the favoured teams got well and truly on top of the weaker outfits, which hadn't been the case in the first couple of weeks of the season. So it'll be interesting if that's a trend or the, the cream is starting to rise to the top where we've got the Broncos, the Storm, uh, the Sharks and also the Panthers all over two try favourites. One of the biggest moves of the round so far has been the Roosters against the Broncos where that line's gone from 10.5 out to 13.5. So that's going to be really interesting to see. We have got a little bit of ordinary weather around as well. So the totals are still quite low compared to what they were last year. So we'll see how it all plays out. We'll have a better idea on all of that next week, I would suggest. The biggest move of the weekend, of course, which isn't necessarily way to money, was when Turbo withdrew from the uh, Manly side. They were six-point favourites before that, that announcement came. It's now one and a half the night's way. There was obviously some thought that he wasn't going to play, so it probably didn't move as much as when it was totally unexpected. It was tricky to find where that market was going to settle when the uh, the news happened on Monday, but it seems like the night slight favourite is probably where it's going to end up. There's still a little bit of doubt over Caelan Ponga as well, I believe, so we'll monitor that. Um, it's going to be an interesting week of footy. As I said, the totals are still low. Um, there's some real changes coming in, so keep an eye on all of that. See how it impacts things, because I think there might be a little bit of shift during the course of the weekend. Good luck over the weekend and gamble responsibly. Let's jump straight into a game that Tristan referenced there. The Knights hosting the Seagulls to kick off round five at McDonald McDonald Jones and the Seagulls slight underdogs catching plus one and a half. You may even see on the screen a juiced plus two and a half for the Seagulls. So you got the Knights that started two and oh, Manly started 0 and two. But in the last two weeks, the Knights went 0 and two, Manly went two and oh. And I'll be tipping that these sides will have opposite results again this week. But which way will it go? For the Knights, they've named the same 17 as last week that went down 18-0. Frizzell had to leave the field against the Sharks with hammy issues, but he is named to start. For Manly, of course, the major news that we all know is Turbo being out with that knee injury for at least one month. Uh, Kula, the speedster, will who played centre last week, will get the fullback role. Before we handicap this game, we're actually giving another start to Trevor Gilmeister. Uh, and his underdog pick of the week is actually more like a four-leg multi, but let's have a listen. G'day, everyone. Uh, I've got a few tips this weekend. I think the Panthers, the certainties for me this weekend, Panthers over the Dogs, Storm over the Raiders, and the Sharkies, I think they'll continue their run. Uh, the Ruffy, well, it's probably not even a Ruffy, but... The Knights over the Seagulls, I think. Uh, no Turbo is an in- influential uh, player, um, you know, for Manly. Uh, him not there. Touch and go, that one. But, yeah, yeah I-, I think the Knights. So Panthers, Storm, Sharkies for the Certainties and the Ruffy Knights. Good luck. Certainties. We'll see about that. And the Knights are slight favourites, but if you put those four together, you'd get like $2.50 odd. So I'm happy to lump them together and call that an underdog pick and give the Axe a chance to bounce back after he did take us on last week with the Cowboys and wasn't too successful. Thanks again to Dabble who provide us with the opportunity to get former players' picks and their perspective And you guys can support this new Aussie bookie dabble that supports us. And as you probably know by now, is more than just your average bookie. You can copy people. And the the guy that we've got to shout out that we mentioned in the recap is Benny Scarf, who co-hosts the No Morals Weekly Horse Racing Preview Show exclusively on Facebook. And that's on the, um, you can find that on the tripod page. He only gave out a a five-leg multi at 343 to one last Saturday, which saluted. And anyone could copy and about 30 people did. Now, back to this game, uh, Manly versus Newcastle, and the Axes pick. Obviously, his his major factor is Turbo being out, and that's the logical place we should start, and it is a shame, but it does actually make this game a lot more intriguing. It's gone from probably everyone expecting Manly should win this to now a much closer affair. 
We don't have a best bet on the game, but I thought this would be a good opportunity, Matthias, for you to share a long-time pod adage, which is injured player theory, in your words, and how much you factored that in. Yeah, so um, just to touch on that, I think this is the first time this year we've sort of we'll see this in full effect. So injured player theory is the sort of mindset and thinking that once a big player is out for a team um, in that initial week, immediately after they're out, that everyone else around them sort of lifts and performs to a higher level because they sort of want to try to compensate for that star player being out. It doesn't sort of count for a squad or a fringe player. It has to be one of those like elite star players for the side. And Turbo definitely falls in into that category for Manly, probably one of the top three players in the NRL, if not in the world. So I, I had Turbo rated at around six and a half points. I know that's a bit less than what sort of sort of Tristan said there, being an eight-point swing. Because I just sort of feel like the, the stage of this of the season with a lot of games trending towards unders, it's not as um it's not as important scoring as, as what it was last year, at least initially. So I think six and a half points is sort of fair. And then Obviously, we've seen Manly come in from a four and a half point favourite, five and a half to a, a small underdog. So, as you said, the game is is a lot tighter. I can make a ca- case for both teams. I sort of see the Knights coming off two straight losses. They're back at home. There's some doubt around Ponga, but I think he will play. He, he's had an extra week to sort of find some of his rhythm that was missing last week against the Sharks. But then on the same side of the coin, you could sort of make a case for Manly that they are two and two. Given they started so poorly, they can't afford any more complacency. And as we spoke about, that injured player theory should give them a boost. But ultimately, it's a pass for me because I think the line's pretty fair where the bookmakers have said it, given where the two sides are and how the rosters are built now. Um, so as I said, I can make a case for both teams, but have to pass the game. And just to add to that, it's not like we're suggesting that if a team loses their best player that they get better. So Manly's not better without Turbo. If I had my money on Manly, I'd rather he be playing. But what you also get is equally, you get everybody chipping in that bit extra and playing harder because they know their key man is out. But you also get that overreaction from the marketplace because a marquee name is out. So you might get a team over uh, overcompensation of the downgrade when in fact the team does compensate quite a lot for their loss. And often that creates overreaction against the side losing that key player. And that's where you'd like to be on that team. But that's just one factor where you like to be on a team with their best player out, uh, you know, in the, in the first week that they're out. But on the other side of things, you know, the Knights' best player is Callum Ponga, who's also been in the news. The rumour is that he's going to, on the verge of signing a, a massive deal to stay. Um, and really this season, he hasn't had a big game yet. He's had two quiet games and two DMPs. So this feels like a huge spot for Ponga to step up and be the best player on the field. And I know the Knights will be desperate, and I know they play well at home. They don't want to lose three on the trot, especially after they won their first two. But then Manly, as you said, should be determined as well. They want to prove a point that they are not going to fall apart missing Turbo. And he's out for a significant stretch. So they've really got to set the tone. And this is cooler as well as a talented player. And let's not forget too, Turbo has not been 2021 Turbo. So they haven't. they're not missing the guy that was untouchable. He's had patchy form because he has been, you know, a little bit injured. Ultimately, if I have to pick a winner in this team, I would lean to the Knights. I think even in their two recent losses, they've been closer than the scoreline suggested, whereas Manly was a little bit flattered by the scoreline deficit over the Raiders. And I think the difference in this game could be a big moment by Kalen Ponga or maybe Bradman Best in the back line. And I will shout out the guys in our group. Some played plus six on the Knights just seeing Turbo limping around and seeing, I think, um, some knee treatment late in that Manly game. And then others even got plus four and a half when it was confirmed that Turbo was out. You're certainly riding a good ticket there. Moving to Friday, hopefully we're on a good ticket with our Warriors best bet, as we said at the top, plus a half a point in the first half. But the game itself is Pickham, uh, Warriors against Cowboys at Morton Daly Stadium. Adam Fanua Blake might be out along with Tavanga, which is a concern for the Warriors. For the Cowboys, the major chain is tab- change is Tabu Ifido out for a little while, also with a knee injury. Drinkwater gets a start at fullback. Again, this is a, a nice evenly matched encounter to start the round. Two teams that both recently dismantled the Broncos, to our surprise, you could say as well. So I know, Matthias, you've watched them both extra closely. Which way, uh, what, what ultimately makes you want to play in New Zealand? Because we know you're on for the best bet. Yeah, for sure. So what ultimately got me sort of there um, is, of course, the number, given that they are a small underdog, whereas we sort of 
I was thought, um, saw them as being a small minus one and a half, two point favorite. The return of Johnson for them is huge, and we saw what a boost it was last week. I think the Warriors are, um, are a, like a momentum team, and they play with a lot of confidence when things are going well. Um, and it's a good opportunity for them this week to sort of build on last week's performance because listening to the press conference and then seeing that game in person, um, they weren't as good as 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 the win sort of showed. They still made quite a few errors and they sort of squandered a lot of opportunities themselves because given that the Broncos did give them a lot of territory and field, field position. So I think that there's plenty for the Warriors to work on and can get better. And I think as I touched on at the top of the show, the Cowboys were humbled last week by the Roosters and the scorelines probably should have been a bit more more severe. And then in that case, we would see the Cowboys as being a small underdog. And I think that the line would sort of head that way as the week goes on. So I think now getting the uh, plus 0.5 try, um, points in the first half, I think it's really pretty pretty valuable there. Um, so as we said, similar to, to round one, where we sort of took the same bet when the Warriors played the Dragons, um, something that we'd have to jump on, um, given that in that 40 minute sort of Sample size in the first half there, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more, more, more restricted in terms of variance. So I think that that's a great play. And as we mentioned, the Cowboys are also missing Hammer, which sort of limits them. And I sort of give the edge to the Warriors forward pack, even if Vanilla Blake is ruled out, and it's only a benefit if he does play, which is probably up in the air 50 50. So hopefully we sort of get a player movement in our favor this time, given that last week we had two against us. But yeah, those are the my sort of factors for taking the Warriors. What about yourself? Well, just to clarify a couple of things you said, I mean, we, we are playing the Warriors, especially because we could find them as an underdog in the sports bet markets. But consensus, they probably are a slight favourite across the board. So that's just us getting advantage of the fact that not every bookie, you know, is totally aligned. And that's what you always want to do and try and find the best um, markets available for the side that you like. And I will also push back what you're saying about the Cowboys. Look, um, I mean, we took the Roosters last week, so I'm happy to say we were totally right in the Roosters you know, we're never in danger of not covering. But look, the Cowboys had how many sin bins? Like, I think they played half an hour of the game with one less man. I don't yeah. necessarily think it's fair to say they should have lost by a lot more. I think a few things did go against them. So I thought a comprehensive loss is a fair um, indication of, of the gap between them and the Roosters. And I do think they'll bounce back. And I wish Vanilla Blake was named, but maybe he still will play. Of course, if he does, he could be hampered. Um, and you want you want him there to, to have that matchup against Tal Malolo, and he's the guy they're going to have to control. But if the Warriors pack can still step up and just play the Cowboys even, then I feel really confident about this bet. I thought Johnson didn't overplay his hand last week, but he's like a calming influence on this team, and he had some classy moments, and I'm expecting more of the same. I actually don't downgrade the Cowboys too much with Drinkwater coming in because I think he's a different type of player, but will actually add ball-playing ability and add a different dimension to their attack. But ultimately, as I said, for the reasons given before, a couple of edges to the Warriors and happy to ride with them again for our best bet if you're brave enough. Later on uh, Friday night, the Broncos host the Roosters. The Roosters are 13 and a half point favorites. Brisbane lost Pat Carrigan and Albert Kelly to serious injuries, plus Flegler is suspended. Capewell will be a welcomed addition back to the Broncos side. And Billy Walters gets a start in the halves for the Roosters. They are unchanged. And I feel like they really announced themselves to the competition last weekend with their play in Townsville, and they have stayed in Queensland for this one. Now, all the talk, at least on the field, is about Brisbane's lacklustre attack. How real is that of a concern for you? Yeah, look, that's not a concern for me when I'm sort of looking at numbers because I do think that it'll turn around and that will get better as the year goes on. But to just um, touch on a point Tristan said, uh, at the top of the show where you sort of said the line was 10 and a half at the 13. The, the, the line last week was actually six and a half and shout out to the undertaker who posted it in the group. And that's one of the advantages of being in the group um, is that he sort of posted it when the Roosters Cowboys game was still live. So it was available. So um, for those who took the six and a half, now that's long gone and you've got a great sort of number in your pocket there with it moving a whole converted try at the 13 and a half. And I'll probably even think this line will probably move to 14. Um, and we've seen the Broncos come off two poor, poor um, sh showings in a row. They will be desperate back in front of their home fans. But even though we've seen such a dramatic line shift, I don't feel that it's enough um, to sort of have the confidence that I can bet the Broncos and sort of feel like I'll get a return long-term because they are experiencing some some cluster injuries. And there's this whole thing circling in the media with this Payne Haas and Albert Kelly fight. 
So not sure whether their attitude and sort of mentality will be where it needs to be, which I think it should, given that they are playing the Roosters and they are so dominant and they can sort of snowball teams and pile on points when they do get the sort of momentum rolling. So from a numbers point of view, like I can only bet on the Broncos or pass the game because if we look at round one, for example, where Reynolds wasn't playing and they were only 10 and a half point underdog against Souths. And if I sort of see the Roosters and Souths have been equal, so now I have to take a high line uh, of 13 and a half and Reynolds is playing. So we probably would have got the same line had the Broncos not experienced all the injuries that, that, that they did have. So I think that's sort of playing into it. And, and if they were fully fit and healthy, I'd probably take the Broncos at 13 and a half. But given that and the fact that I'm not too sure where their headspace might be. Going to have to sit this game out. And as we discussed on the recap, some of those blowout scores in round four have definitely uh, led to increased lines in round five. And this game is a double-digit line, but it's not even one of the uh, biggest two, uh, two or three lines of the weekend. And it is a high line for a Brisbane team that's not completely hopeless and does still have some talent. But another thing I said in the recap is I'd rather see a player who I think is talented start to fire, such as Katoni Staggs, rather than have my money at stake again and hope that he fires because he's due to, because sometimes guys just aren't right and just don't have that mojo. So it's a wait and see with me for Brisbane. And you mentioned the cluster injuries. They can make a game of this if, if they all play to their best. But whereas with the Roosters, you kind of know what you're going to get. I think staying in camp in Queensland is an advantage. And I do think there'll be an emphasis to back up last week's effort. And if they do that, they'll deal Brisbane a third straight loss, which is funny because after week two, we were saying Brisbane could be undefeated in the first month, but now they're staring down the barrel of three losses in a row. Moving to Saturday in Wagga, the Raiders play the Storm, and the Storm are another big favourite, minus 13.5, maybe minus 12.5, depending where you look. Both sides are unchanged. As I said at the top, the second straight game out in the country for the Green Machine. So another high line, but, you know, that storm side was insatiable last weekend and they are kind of suited for that daytime footy. Um, but what's got you onto the Raiders in this one, Matthias? Yeah, so as we sort of said, we think the line's a little bit too high. The storm played a near perfect um, 80 minutes against the dogs there and um, couldn't have been any more, more impressive in the public's eyes. And the Raiders were pretty impressive in their own right, despite losing looking at the scoreboard by 25 to six or whatever it was there. Um, so I think historically Canberra do play the storm tough and they sort of have a forward pack that, that can match the storm. So I'm expecting something close to, to that here. The game's in Mudgee, which is not in the traditional home of Canberra. Wagga, um, I think last Wagga, week Raiders played in Mudgee. Yep. But there's still some travel for the storm. So there's a small edge there in Canberra's favor. Um, and I think that, the Storm can take advantage of, of the momentum swings um, and sort of pile on points better than most. So I, I love the fact that we're getting the first half line because we don't have to worry about the full um, 80 minutes in case Canberra do sort of uh, lose touch with, with the Storm there. But um, given um, the, that the Raiders have started the last two weeks pretty poorly and been multiple tries behind, I think that there is an emphasis on them starting well and they'll sort of keep the game tight, play through the middle, and they can match the Storm early. And I think six and a half is a great line. Yeah, I think this game will be closer than expected. If you have to pick a winner, you would just you would back the Melbourne Storm spine to be the difference. But we're talking about a line that's over two converted tries. So I'm happy to be taking the points, and we feel the first half's the best, best way to execute that. But let's roll that straight into the mixed matchup because we're going to take the Raiders, and they are the side we're riding at a juicy price. But given they've got a very tough opponent, we're taking the Canberra to outscore North Queensland and that's paying $3.25, and you can have a max stake of $100 on that on Top Sport. Use the promo code TRIPOD if you haven't joined, but you would like to. Now, something about the mixed matchup, it's an underdog every week, in case people forgot. So it might not have felt possible a few weeks ago, but it's actually a lot easier to lose three in a row than it is to win three in a row when you're an underdog every time. And despite the fact we've never lost three mixed matchups in a row, but we've had win streaks of seven in a row. We've won six in a row other times. I'm just giving you guys that warning. We're a solid underdog. We're paying over $3 this week. We could easily lose. Um, but having said that, I like this bet a lot. I like the price. Like a daytime team playing um, against a side that's in night conditions. I definitely feel New Zealand, North Queensland could be tight and low scoring. And I think the fact that the Storm have such well-known firepower means that the Green Machine should want to come out and play some positive footy Saturday afternoon. Give us a shot. 
Later Saturday, the Rabbitohs play the Dragons and the Rabbitohs are nine and a half point favourites. Nichols is out and that hurts losing him and it did hurt him last week. They lost him very early. Taff is included on the bench, which I think is interesting. For the Dragons, your guess is as good as mine. At this point, they've named the same spine that they changed in against Para. But that did not work. But you've got Amon, um, Amone at 14 and Sloan in the reserve. So we'll see. Sua also back from suspension. The Dragons did win this, uh, at least won the Charity Shield a few weeks ago. But can they beat Souths again, Matthias? I don't think they can. And for me, this is a similar handicap to what the Eels and Dragons game was last week. So we've seen the Dragons being beaten by two superior sides, two weeks running. Um, and now they face another sort of heavyweight. And what makes me sort of feel that the result will be any different? I don't think it will. I think South is sitting at one and three. They get a sort of easy draw in the next month so they can start to get a bit of a run coming in the next few rounds. Um, the Dragons have been dominated through the middle of the last two weeks we've seen. Um, and South's forward pack is as good as any. They can sort of take advantage of that. And then as you just um, touched on there with their spine and the reshuffle, um, whether Empire plays or Bird in 5-8, um, I think Griffin will stick with the same spine because um, I think there's some issues with the other two. But um, even if um, he does sort of change it and go back to Sloan and Amon, I still don't feel that that gives the Dragons any sort of advantage. Um, South have an eight-day turnaround versus the Dragons at six. And as you touched on, they get the added uh, motivation of that Charity Shield revenge. Um, because the Dragons did sort of carry on a bit after that. It was like they won a grand final. Um, I made the line sort of 12. So for me, it was a pretty decent edge to South. But you didn't quite um, like them the same way, Jacob. I guess what just keeps me off is that you don't really get a lot of value when you play against a side that's directly off a drubbing that we all saw last weekend. So that's where I feel like the line, you know, probably can't be that low. Um, and And... Although I wouldn't be surprised at all if Souths win this comfortably. They've had the toughest draw of any side, arguably, to start the year and certainly the last three weeks. And I feel like, and because of that, you're, you can only play as well as your opponent lets you. So I feel like Souths are probably better than most people realise. And they're going to show that pretty soon. It could be this week. Just won't quite be with, um, with us on it, but we'll see how they go later. Saturday night, the Titans host the Eels. I think this is the first rematch in this uh, young season. The Eels are seven and a half point favourites at the Gold Coast. The Titans get back Furmore, uh, Sammy and Liu, all who missed with COVID protocols. Eels get back Sean Lane from an injury and he is set to start. So last week they both won the Titans and the Eels in completely opposite fashion. And of course, I mentioned the round one clash where the Eels got a narrow win over the Titans. How much do you factor in that uh, that earlier clash? Yeah, so you touched on the rematch there. I'm not sure what the schedulers are doing, given that there's a rematch in round five, but that's probably a, a whole other podcast we could have. But I think um, in the first meeting, I think the Eels were sort of in control of that game for large periods. And I think that the Titans found their way in front somehow in that second half. And they were on the wrong end of a few calls that we sort of touched on in, in the recap on, on round one there. But I sort of feel like the Eels um, are the better team and were in control. So given that they did let the Titans back into the game, I think the Eels will will be more focused for 80 minutes that they that they should be able to um, uh, dominate the Titans here. But then when I look at the Eels, they are like a legit top four team at the moment. So I don't want to bet against them unless I'm getting real line value, which I don't feel like we are. I think the market's pretty spot on. Um, and the Titans did have some excuses of their own last week. I think in the press conference afterwards, um, uh, Holbrook was sort of saying four or five players in his squad had COVID that they sort of dealt with during the um, Tigers build up. So, and they had a short, short turnaround as well. Now they get a full nine day turnaround, which is the longest one you can have. So I think they'll equally be up for it. And I want to prove that they can hang with these top sides. Uh, but I do ultimately think that they fall short in the halves to really trouble the good sides until they say they sort of prove it to me with, Brimson and Sexton. And I think Asako is sort of a downgrade on what Campbell can do as well. So if if I was forced to sort of bet a side, I would bet the Eels. But I don't really feel like we're getting enough value to, to sort of take them. And Parramatta would be undefeated this season if not for that 80th minute try against the Sharks. They look like a genuine contender to me. We haven't added any late best bets this season. Every best bet we've shared has been in the first five minutes of the pod. But for example, last weekend, once the lineup changes were announced, for the Dragons, you did play the minus nine and a half on Dabble uh, in a, in a multi, Sunday multi that got up. So that's the kind of play we probably would have been on if we knew that spine disruption to the Dragons. But I hate to jump on a team because I kind of wish I was on them last week. 
Um, so that's where, you know, you somewhat you miss the boat because now the secret's out because the Eels looked so good last weekend. But I definitely won't go against the Eels here. And if you're taking the Titans, you're taking an inconsistent side. Now, they should be up for this one. They offer scratchy performance at home with some excuses, as you said, and a longer turnaround, no travel. But are the Titans willing to roll the sleeves up and kind of battle a legit side here? We didn't really see it last year too often. So off we'll find out, but it'll be from the sideline. Moving to Sunday, the two biggest lines of the season so far, both on the Sunday slate. The Sharks play the Tigers, and we're getting involved. We're taking the Tigers plus 18.5 on Unibet. But the consensus line is plus 17 and a half, and 18 being a pretty key number, pretty much every even number is. Cronulla's unchanged at home as well. The Tigers are also unchanged. Um, the Sharkies are another team that you could say could be undefeated this year, if not for conceding a very late try. So why do you want to go against them this week, put on us? It's a classic spot, isn't it? The team that can't look any more impressive versus a team that no one wants to touch. And we even saw last week when Connor Tracy was um, ruled out, they moved Talakai into centres and he absolutely exploded down the left-hand side there. So everything that they're touching at the moment sort of turning to gold, but we're sort of hoping um, that this week we sort of feel that we're getting a strong enough edge to take take the Tigers. And as you touched on, they don't even have to win this game. They just have to be competitive for a large period that will sort of get us um, over the line there. And I think had the Tigers sort of held on and won last week, we probably would have seen a line of about 14 and a half, which is where I've set set this number. So I think we're getting a, a decent edge. They are better defensively than what their sort of record shows. I think out of the last eight tries they've conceded, only three of them have been line breaks, the other five have been kicks. So I think that they are pretty solid and they can be, be resilient despite the fact that they are limited with the ball. Um, if they can sort of hang with the Sharks and frustrate the Sharks, then they'll have every bit of a chance to sort of hang hang with this number. I do expect the Sharks to win, but um, let's uh, go for the Tigers to sort of hang. Yeah, the Tigers kept New Zealand trialless in the second half two weeks ago, and then they essentially kept the Titans trialless, um, apart from that fluky moment in the final play of the game. And the Sharkies are a good defensive side too, and if this is like a gritty, grindy type match, that's fine for us with the amount of points we're catching. I agree. I think the line is too high. I know that the Tigers are an eyesore to watch, but that's also probably why some people don't want to be on them. Now, Hastings is still out, so it's worth mentioning that, um, and that's going to make their attack even worse. But as we said, we don't need them to score too many to necessarily cover this line. Now, I've got a new nickname for Cronulla. I want to call Cronulla the Shire Storm because, to me, they're like a poor man's Melbourne. You've got leaders like Finucane, Hines. They're gritty in defence. They can hurt you in attack. And I mean that as a compliment. We'll see if that name sticks or not. I don't know. But um, but they feel Melbourne-esque to me in what they're building down there. And obviously, they're, they're a long way off that level. But it does feel like they're headed that way. Now, if they were on a Melbourne Storm level, they should be 18.5-point favourites. But as I say, to be more than three converted tries, it's the Channel 9 game, which the Tigers wouldn't be involved in too many times. It's going to be ugly. I guarantee you that. But we, we've got to be on Madge's men. And maybe make it a little less ugly. You can have some fun. You can comment uh, in this video, as well as all your own tips and your thoughts. Comment who you think will score the final try in Tiger Sharks on Sunday afternoon and the minute you think they'll score for the tiebreaker. And the closest comment on this video or the winning mood on Facebook or YouTube will win an NRL jersey of their choice. And speaking of the winning mood, because of Daylight Savings, it's now an hour earlier now that Daylight Savings is over if you're uh, south of the Queensland border. So 7.30 p.m. live everywhere. And we talk about Supercoach. My team finally scored over 1,000 points. So I might even be learning a thing or two being involved in that show. Final game to cap when it's the biggest line of the season. It's the Panthers minus 19.5 point favorites against the Bulldogs. I think this one's at Combank Stadium. Flanagan gets a season debut. Kyle Flanagan, that is, for the Dogs. But otherwise, they're a similar side that lost 44-0 to Melbourne. Uh, and it doesn't get any easier playing the Panthers. And they're unchanged. And they haven't even really looked like losing in 2022 yet. So we got burned last week going against the Panthers. You didn't have an appetite to, to do that again, Mateos? I was close to sort of looking at the dogs. Uh, but ultimately happy to sort of pass the game. We saw the dogs come crashing back down to earth last week after they started the year so well. People were sort of high on them, but I think that they sort of showed the level that they're actually at. 
Um, and I was actually saying in the preseason podcast, I think Flanagan's a better halves partner than what Avarillo was because sort of a bit of yin and yang to what Burton can do. You have one sort of controlling half and one running half. But being put into sort of this spot in a losing team against the Panthers, sort of Barrett sort of set him up for failure. And it's a bit of a lose-lose scenario for, for Flanagan. So I feel sorry for him there. But um, And Cleary wasn't at his best last week. Um, so he did show signs of rust. So we were sort of somewhat right, even though Souths were on the wrong end of the scoreline. So I can see a scenario where Cleary's at his best and the Panthers can sort of steamroll the dogs similar to what the Storm did. But I also sort of can see the dogs um, sort of fighting and hanging tough in this game because the Panthers, we've seen the tendency that in these sort of lesser games, that do coast a bit. And I don't really want to lay 19 and a half um, or 20 and a half where they sort of are happy just to get through the game and not go through all, all the gears that they do have. Um, so ultimately happy to pass. Um, but the dogs sort of need to be in the, in the contest the, the entire time to cover. They're not a side that can sort of chase points if they are down early. So from that point of view, um, can make a case for, for both sides. Has Flanagan been set up to fail or is this the ultimate redemption story? Um, we'll find out on Sunday, but you know what? Yeah, it would be shocked with any other result than a comfortable Panthers win. But in saying that, if I have to play the line, I could only play the dogs. Couldn't get like a plus 10 and a half first half, which might have got me over the line. Um, or even I think there was a 20 and a half available earlier today, but not now. Um, but 20 is a massive line for early in the season for a team that hasn't given up. The dogs aren't that bad. Just last week, totally got away from them and snowballed. So I could only play them in terms of line value, um, but understanding that the style of play is slightly shifting towards favouring some of these um, these these powerhouse sides. So you want to take the the underdogs sparingly, I think. Well, in the end, our three best bets, we are on three underdogs of varying degrees, but we'll see how we go. That's going to do it for our show tonight. If you're backing our tips or any tips, you always do it responsibly. If you want to follow all our content and, and all the guys that we talk about, all the gun tipsters, the number one place is to jump in our Facebook group, the Tripod Punters Tips Forum. That's just where you're going to find the, the vast majority of the content, but we try and, and share it in a few other places. So there's multiple spots you can find us, depending on how you like to follow. Um, so hopefully we'll be back Sunday night for the recap, hopefully to recap a bounce back week for us. Yeah, for sure. Bounce back week in, um, incoming. And I'll be looking at um, posting a multi tomorrow, like always, every Thursday. So hopefully we can sort of get that off to, to a winning start because we're minus eight units so far. We've been close on a few, but definitely something that we can build upon. So for now, gamble responsibly. Everyone, Lego. Lego. Lego.